So as we come to God's word this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer, asking for his blessing upon our time. Our Father in heaven, we come humbly before you asking that you would please speak to us through your word. We want to be disciples of Jesus that hear his voice and follow obediently. And yet, Father, our sins, they can distract. Our own frailties can be hindrances. And so I pray that this morning that you would help us to put distractions aside. You'd help us to rest in Christ and to be able to see all that he has done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it was the case that uh, throughout the pandemic, people just wanted to get outside and uh, so they decided to go on trails that many of them had never been on and going in places they'd never been and it began to tax the United States uh, search and rescue teams uh, all around uh, our nation as many found themselves in situations that they couldn't get themselves out of. And the, as is the case with most search and rescue operations, they are often get into that situation out of innocence. There is not a, no one goes up into the mountains or slides down a hillside because they're uh, trying to be a... Uh, a subject for search and rescue. They are often driven there out of curiosity, uh, desiring to, to go one step further, decide to figure out that trail looks interesting, but before they know it, they are in trouble. Such was the case in the summer of 2018 that no doubt you'll remember when 12 boys and their assistant soccer coach went exploring in a massive cave in Northern Thailand. It's a cave they had been in before many times it was frequented by the, the locals, but this time their curiosity took them yet farther into the cave. But the problem was that there had been a number of uh, recent rains and water was rising within the cave. And so as they went deeper in, they suddenly found themselves trapped as the water began to rise and cut off their exit. And from that first day that they went in, which was really uh, a birthday party for one of the boys, uh, began a harrowing two weeks in which rescue teams from all over the world descended on northern Thailand trying to figure out a way to save the 13 souls that were trapped deep under the mountain. The situation was perilous for several reasons. The only way out required diving through several miles of submerged passageways and some of the boys didn't even know how to swim. In addition to this, at a couple points, the cave narrowed to such a, such a degree that it couldn't even fit a diver with an uh, oxygen tank on the back. It, could, it was only wide enough for a body to slip through. And on top of that, rain was in the forecast and that the, the cave system could fill up completely if they didn't act quickly. And so it really was a battle against water. In the end, it took several divers over several hours just to receive one boy, and they did that for all 13 souls. But miraculously, the search and rescue divers were able to save all 13 out of that cave. It's still an amazing story today, and it fascinates us because of the amazing efforts, these many divers that risked their lives in order to go and to try to save these uh, people that were trapped inside. And they succeeded in the face of what seemed to be impossible odds. 13 lives were saved. Search and rescue did their job. They sought and they rescued all 13 individuals. Well, in our passage today, we're gonna see a different kind of search and rescue. Rather than people searching for lost people, we're going to see God searching for lost souls. In particular, we're going to see Jesus, God's son, revealing the fact that he came to earth with a mission, a mission to search for and to save people who are spiritually lost. And friends, no news could be sweeter to our ears and to hear that a savior came to rescue us when we were in our most desperate state. 
And so I invite you to please turn with me in your personal copy of God's Word to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn there in the Pew Bible in front of you to page 1043. Page 1043. Today we're going to look at a story that is familiar to just about all Sunday school children. But because of that, it's often not studied for its richness. It's told very quickly and with the, feature, the fact that it features a short person, a short man who had to climb a tree, which we don't see anywhere else in the scriptures. And so it's, it's a funny story. It's a fun story in that sense. But there's deep richness here as well for us. Just to set a little bit of context, last week, you remember, we looked at the story of Jesus healing a blind man. Well, the other gospels identify him as Bartimaeus. He was beside the road there at Jericho and he was calling out, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus indeed did have mercy. He stopped and he turned and he brought the man to him and he healed him. And this man immediately began to follow Jesus. Today, we're going to see another man who wanted to see Jesus. But the problem was not that he was blind, but that he was short. And so let's see how Jesus enables this man to see as well in uh, Luke chapter 19. Follow along as I read the ver first 10 verses of this chapter. It says, He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see G who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Friends, this morning I want to show you how the story of Zacchaeus illustrates Jesus' heart to us. It illustrates his heart to seek and to save sinners so that you and I would turn to him in repentance and faith. As we see the portrait of our Savior in displayed in the story of Zacchaeus. May you and I be drawn to Jesus ourselves. Verse 10 records really the mission of Jesus and I believe the summary statement of what Jesus and Luke the author wants us to get out of this story. Just look at verse 10 again with me. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The reason for this story is to illustrate this point, that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Why did he come to earth? What was Jesus' mission? It was to search and to rescue. It was to seek and to save. And so we see here, we're going to, frame our time here this morning by looking first at how Jesus came to seek the lost and then we'll see secondly how Jesus came to save the lost. And so first illustrated in this story we see Jesus' heart in that Jesus came to seek the lost and we see this in verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5 Jesus came to seek the lost and we, we see three facets of his seeking in these verses. The first is that he seeks notorious sinners. He seeks notorious sinners in verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 here sets the setting. It says, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And Jesus is passing through the city of Jericho. Jericho is a city that sits about 18 miles to the 
east of Jerusalem. And this is a little map that shows that Jerusalem is nestled up in the hill country. Jericho is down in the Jordan Rift Valley, down by the Jordan River, near the Dead Sea, below sea level. And, uh, and so Jesus is on his way, coming uh, up from Jericho. He will then go to Jerusalem on his way to the cross. But right now he is in Jericho with pilgrims who are making their way up to Jerusalem for Passover. And they all would travel together. It is more safe to stay in a group. And so this group of pilgrims going up to Jerusalem is now passing through Jericho. But before he gets to Jerusalem to pay for sins, he is saving and seeking to save sinners as he goes along. And we meet one such sinner here in verse 2, and his name is Zacchaeus. Look at verse 2 with me. It says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And so we're introduced to his name. His name is Zacchaeus. It's a Jewish name. And what made Zacchaeus distinctive was not just that he was a tax collector, but that he was a chief tax collector. This is the only place in the New Testament where we have this designation of a chief tax collector, giving us a little bit of insight into the world of tax collecting there in the first century, that there were uh, set up in somewhat of a managerial sense, men who were over other tax collectors. Now, Tax collectors, as the name indicates, were men who collected taxes for Rome. Rome was the one who was in charge of the whole Mediterranean world at this time. And in their empire, they wanted to collect taxes to continue to feed back to Rome. And so they uh, hired people to be able to collect these taxes. They also had the Roman soldiers on hand in case there was any trouble. But they would collect monies from the peoples that they were over. And because of this, because money was collected from the populace, they were hated by the populace. Because the men who then were set about to collect the taxes didn't just collect the required amount, they also charged a higher amount and skimmed off the top for themselves. And the, everybody knew it. Everybody knew that these men who were seeking to collect taxes were not just taking the required amount, they were, they were requiring more they were extorting the people and defrauding them. Zacchaeus was the chief defrauder, the chief extortionist, as he was in charge of other tax collectors in his district. And so he didn't just benefit from his own scheming off the top, he benefited from the defrauding of other men under him. And so that's why in verse 2 it says at the end that he was rich. Of course he was rich, he was a tax collector. This is what they were known for. They stole from others in order to line their own pockets. And so he had considerable wealth. And so therefore, at this point, just from these first two verses, there's two things that we should know. The first is that he was hated by his fellow Jews. He was essentially an outcast among Israel at that time. He had more friendship with the Roman soldiers than he did with his fellow Jewish citizens. He was a traitor in their eyes. He was working for the oppressor, for Rome. And throughout the Gospel of Luke, we see that tax collectors are identified as the most immoral among the society. They're often grouped together with prostitutes. And they were considered men who were unclean, wicked, and corrupt. But there's another thing that should come to our mind after just reading these first two verses. Particularly after reading the fact that he was rich. We've met a rich man just recently in the Gospel of Luke. Just a chapter earlier in chapter 18, we were introduced to a rich man. A rich man that Jesus had a conversation with and after that rich man turned away from Jesus, Jesus made the following declaration. He said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And so we read that this man is a tax collector and he's rich. And we say, 
this man must be far from the kingdom of God based upon what Jesus just said a chapter earlier. It seems practically impossible that this immoral man who is surrounded by everything that he could want, all of the riches that he could ever desire, he, it seems practically impossible this man would be saved. That this man would humble himself in any sort of way to Jesus. He will probably respond just like the rich young ruler that we met earlier. Walk away from Jesus, even when Jesus offers him salvation. And so Zacchaeus, by all who knew him and all who could see him that day, knew him to be the notorious sinner. But he wasn't just a notorious sinner in the eyes of others. He's the, he was a sinner in the eyes of God as well. The Lord knew not just the outward behavior. They, he knew the wickedness of his own heart. And so this is why Zacchaeus is an illustration of what Jesus calls in verse 10, the lost. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. The lost, friends, refers to each and every one of us because of our sin. We have been lost without God. Oh, we may not be as outwardly wicked or immoral as Zacchaeus or you know, other tax collectors, prostitutes. Take your pick of the Im immorality. But we all fall short of God's glory. The Bible says that none of us are righteous, no, not one. We have each turned to our own way. And because we've turned off of God's path and we've charted out our own way, sought to be our own Lord, set, set the, our own agenda for our lives, we are lost. We are wandering with no hope, with no light. We are in darkness groping around. We are just as lost spiritually as those boys were in that cave in Thailand. We got ourselves in, but we can't get ourselves out. We need a rescuer. And this story will continue to show us that Jesus is that rescuer for you and I. But not only does Jesus seek out notorious sinners, but he also, secondly, seeks curious seekers. He seeks out curious seekers. We see this as the narrative turns in verses three and four. Strangely enough, this hardened sinner has an interest in Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now, most likely, he had heard about Jesus. The stories had been circulating around Israel for some time. Uh, it, Jesus has been ministering for, for about three years at this point, and so the stories, no doubt, are, have made their rounds. But not only because the stories are, are going through Israel, but the stories are going through the tax collector community. Because you'll know, remember that Jesus has had a special heart towards tax collectors as well. Luke has noted that for us. There's been others in the, in the industry that Jesus has sought out for discipleship. Luke chapter five says that Jesus walked up to Levi as he's at his tax collector booth and he says to Levi, follow me. And he gets up from the table and he follows Jesus and then he hosts a feast with all of his fellow tax collector friends and say, come meet the Savior, come meet the Jesus that I'm now following. In addition to that, Luke 15 says that Jesus would dine, would fellowship, would, would, would have meals with, recline at table with tax collectors and sinners. And so no doubt the word begins to spread within the tax collector community about this Jesus. All the other Jews, and particularly the religious ones, like the scribes and the Pharisees, wanted nothing to do with tax collectors. They'd snub their noses. They would, they would keep far away from them in order to not stain themselves. But this Jesus was different. This Jesus had a concern for even the most sinful and the most broken that had to have piqued the interest of Zacchaeus. And so it seems that he doesn't really know who this man was, but he was, it says he was seeking to see who Jesus was. The word had begun to spread, Jesus is coming through town. Oh yeah, that Jesus guy, I wonder who he is. 
but he's got a problem. He can't actually see, get into position to be able to see the face of Jesus because he was small in stature, it says. He was prevented. But notice he didn't go, ah, don't worry about it. Okay, I'll, I'll see Jesus some other day. No, he's interested enough that he's going to try to work through the problem. He's going to find a solution. And so, verse 4, he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he, Jesus, was about to pass that way. He was determined to get eyes on this man that he's heard so much about. And so he runs ahead of his entourage. The, the crowd must have been great that was going through Jericho so that he couldn't even stand back far enough to be able to get a real good look at him. So he runs ahead to a tree that uh, he knew he could be able to get, pun intended, a bird's eye view of the situation. And the sycamore trees could grow quite large. Uh, I got a picture here of, this is the, the largest known one in Israel. Um, this one isn't in Jericho, but it gives you a sense of the sprawling branches and how someone could easily uh, crawl up into that. I mean, that's like a perfect climbing tree uh, to be able to, to get up into those branches. But he wouldn't have to get up very far in order to just get ahead above the rest and to be able to see over the heads of the crowd and see what Jesus looked like. And so Zacchaeus was curious about who Jesus is. And so he climbed a tree and then waited for Jesus to pass. He goes, I know he's coming this way. There's only one main road through town, particularly with a crowd that size. And I'm just going to wait for him here. And it's here that as we see the action of Zacchaeus, that we see that among the lost that Jesus came to seek and to save includes those who are curious seekers. Even today, there are those who are converted and turned to Jesus. They often find themselves in curiosity, growing in curiosity about who Jesus is and his message. Now, this isn't to say that everyone who is converted has this growing curiosity. Sometimes God just simply interrupts their lives like Paul on the road to Damascus, just boom, bam, and gets a hold of their attention and uh, it changes instantly. But for many others, there's a, a growing interest in their minds as they have heard about Jesus. They've seen others who have followed Jesus and they want what they have. And so they begin to take interest and begin to get a little bit closer and a little bit closer, begin to hear a little bit more about who this Jesus is. And so whoever begins to grow in, in terms of seeking out Jesus, we can know that the Spirit of God is the one at work in their hearts even before they are ultimately converted. The Spirit prepares people to come to Christ. He begins working on our hardened hearts so that we would have an interest. How is it that Zacchaeus, full of riches, a house of, full of everything, all the possessions he could want, why is it that his heart was soft? Because the Spirit was at work. Curiosity alone won't save anyone. Curiosity in Jesus alone won't save anyone. In order for a sinner to take interest in the Savior, it takes a supernatural work of the Spirit. In order for a sinner to take interest in the Savior, it takes a supernatural work of the Spirit. And we can be certain that was what was taking place in Zacchaeus' heart. But there's a third facet of Jesus seeking the lost that we can see in this text. And that is, thirdly, he seeks individual persons. He seeks individual persons in verse 5. Now, we need to uh, picture this scene for us, okay? So remember, we've got Zacchaeus clinging to a branch up in a tree. He's nestled in there ready for this crowd to pass by. Jesus, on the other hand, has been walking through the city of Jerusalem, or Jericho, rather, and uh, he's got a, a, a ton of people around him. Again, such a great crowd of people that, that uh, Zacchaeus isn't even able to see Jesus. And so this crowd is, is moving through. There's no doubt lots of activity, lots of excitement. Uh, he may be talking to individuals, teaching people, maybe bringing uh, people up that need healing. Uh, who knows the hubbub that's around as they begin to tell the Jerichoites, hey, this is Jesus, he's here, this is the one, and we're headed to Jerusalem. 
And so there's all this activity and the people are all focused on Jesus of Nazareth is here walking through our city and we're with him. They, I would imagine, uh, have no idea Zacchaeus is up there. Maybe somebody saw him climb the tree and go, that's weird, I don't know where, where that loser's going. Um, but, but they didn't really, that wasn't the, the main show. The main thing was Jesus, they're focused on him. And so this, as this crowd begins to go through, there's all this activity. The crowd's all focused on Jesus. Zacchaeus is curious, curious enough to simply get in a tree. His plan, remember, was just to go into the tree, watch Jesus pass by, and then he goes home. I mean, that's all he's, he's just wanting to, to see who this man was. But the wonderful thing is that Jesus had greater plans for Zacchaeus than Zacchaeus had for himself. In the midst of the craziness, all these people around, Jesus is seeking Zacchaeus. And he then stops at this sycamore tree. And the people that are going, Whoa, what, what, is, what is Jesus stopping for? And he, he looks up into the tree and he calls out to Zacchaeus. I'm sure this puzzled the people. What is he doing? Why, why is he interested in the tree? Oh, there's a man up there. Why does he care about him? Oh, it's Zacchaeus. Maybe they're from there. They knew who he was. Either way, they, this was not part of the plan. But what we see next is that Jesus has a particular interest in this man. He is seeking him out. And notice what he says to him. He says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Jesus knows this man's name. Did he hear it from others? Maybe. I believe he was, it was revealed to him supernaturally by the Spirit that he knew this man was up in the, the tree. Jesus was on a mission to save him. And so he moves toward him and calls him by name. In the midst of the crowd, he singles out Zacchaeus. And the reason he asks him to come down quickly is because he says, for I must stay at your house today. There's an immediacy and an urgency in Jesus' words. Today he must stay at his house. Can't be tomorrow. Why must he stay at his house? Well, the reason doesn't leap, I think, out at the text, but, but we can say that he must, he must stay at his house in order to, I think in a broad way to show the fact that he is the, the seeking and, and saving Savior. He can display his saving purpose. Again, verse 10, he did all of this with Zacchaeus because the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. By staying at Zacchaeus' house, he can show his heart to all those around. But more personally, he wasn't just choosing Zacchaeus as an object lesson. He was choosing Zacchaeus because he loved Zacchaeus. He's going to his house because he cares for this man. He's not just using Zacchaeus. He is seeking and saving Zacchaeus. He is personally pursuing the sinner because he cares for him. And folks, here again, we see the heart of Jesus Christ for sinners. He very personally pursues broken and lost people. He does this so that he, they can see that he is all that they need. He cares about each and every one of us. And this is the good news that we need to hear this morning, that Jesus cares about each one of us individually. He doesn't just see us as a blob of people, but he knows us individually. Church, don't we know the individual love of Christ that he has pursued each one of us in our lives and in our stories that he came to get us to open up our hearts, to open up our eyes that we would see the glory of Christ. He didn't leave us in our sin and in our darkness. He didn't leave us to follow our own way and our own path, but he saw that we needed rescuing and he came to get us. Friends, this is the love of our Savior. This is why he came, is to seek and to save us. Now, if you're here this morning and you feel far from Christ and you feel like your sin has kept you distant, I want you to see the heart of Jesus for you this morning. His desires that you would know him, that you would be saved from your sin. 
He has an open heart towards all sinners. He desires that you would turn from running life without him and confess him as Lord. And so we see in the first part of this passage that Jesus came to seek the lost. But he also came to save the lost. And that's what we see in verses 6 through 10. Jesus came to save the lost. As we saw several facets of Jesus' seeking, let's look now at several facets of the salvation he gives. The salvation Jesus gives, number one, brings joy. It brings joy. And we see this in verse 6. Look at it with me. So he, being Zacchaeus, hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Jesus speaks. He calls up to the man in the tree. The crowd hushes. What is Zacchaeus going to do? We know he's only in the tree because of a curiosity about Jesus. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to know a little bit more about him. But now Jesus is kind of up in the ante and saying, All right, you see me, but I'm going to press in farther, Zacchaeus. I'm going to get a little more uncomfortable with you. I'm going to your house today. Will Zacchaeus welcome Jesus' intrusion as a gift going above and beyond what he desired? Or would he turn it away as an unwelcomed intrusion? Is it possible that a rich man is able to respond differently than the last rich man that we met? Because Jesus said, it's impossible. But he also said, with God, all things are possible. Who's able to break through into a rich man's heart? It's it's God himself. God came to seek and to save Zacchaeus, and his grace is irresistible. Now, verse 6 shows us that Zacchaeus changed He accepted the invitation of Jesus. And so he immediately obeys Jesus. He hurried and came down and it says received him joyfully. He, the words are identical from verse five to verse six. Jesus says, hurry and come down. And it says that he has hurried and came down. He obeyed in exactly the same way that Jesus called him to. No delay, no hesitation, no excuses. And it says then that he received him joyfully. This word for received is is not like received in an embrace or received in friendship, but it means to receive hospitably. It refers to hosting. Zacchaeus was willing to take Jesus into his home. Now there's some debate about whether the rest of this passage takes place, the dialogue takes place out in the Jericho street next to the sycamore tree or whether the rest of the passage takes place in Zacchaeus' home. You really could go either way. I tend to think it remained in the Jericho street so that all people could hear Jesus' declaration that he came to seek and save the lost. But again, the text could lend itself either way. But what we get here in verse 6 is that he is willing and joyfully happy to receive Jesus. He received him joyfully. Zacchaeus came out of the tree a different man than the man who went up. Curiosity about Christ drove him up the tree. But love for Christ drove him out of the tree. And throughout the Bible, we see that this is a common trait of those who are saved, those who are converted, those who are turned from their sin, repent of their sin, and turn to to God in faith, receive great joy. Psalm 20, verse 5 says, May we shout for joy over your salvation, and the name of our God set up our banners. David, when he sinned greatly in in the matter of Bathsheba, He prays in Psalm 51, verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. He knew there was a joy that came with salvation and he wanted to be restored in that joy through repentance. Or there's Matthew chapter 13 where we hear of the parable. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. 
This man has found the gospel, has found the treasure, and in his joy, everything else fades in value, fades in comparison. This thing is the supreme treasure of his heart, illustrating what it looks like for one who comes to Christ, that they see Christ as the supreme joy and supreme value, and everything else can be left behind. Acts chapter 13 describes the joy of the Gentiles when they learned that salvation was open to them as well. It says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. As they heard the word that salvation was available to them, they rejoiced. Friends, when Jesus transforms a heart, there is great joy. The gift of salvation is given to one, is not given to one who doesn't have a desire for it. The salvation comes to one who greatly is rejoicing in the fact that they have received salvation. It's not like, oh great, you gave me a perk, a benefit, don't really need it, but appreciate it. No, someone who receives salvation recognizes that they have nothing, that they are, they are desperate until they receive it and then they're given Christ, they're given salvation and their, their heart explodes with joy. Me? You mean I am able to receive salvation? I am able to be counted among the saved? And I believe this is one of the signs of a true work of God in our hearts that there is joy that accompanies our salvation. We will rejoice that we have Jesus as our treasure if we truly have repented of our sins and believed in him. This is a joy that Jesus gives to all his children. And so let us be reminded, friends, those of us who maybe have walked with Christ for a while, that there is a joy in our salvation that is found when we set our sights on Christ alone. This world has many cares and many troubles. There's many things that weigh upon us and seek to steal our joy. But you take it all away. And the end of, and the, end, and the last thing, we can say that we have Christ. And for that, we can rejoice. Amen? Well, in this passage, not everyone's rejoicing. And this leads us to the next facet of Jesus' salvation. And that is, the salvation that Jesus brings angers the self-righteous. The salvation Jesus brings angers the self-righteous. Well, Zacchaeus is there rejoicing, coming down from the tree. The crowd is grumbling. There's a dark cloud that's hanging over the crowd. And here the true heart of the crowd is revealed. Just a few verses previous, the last verse of, of, verse eight, of chapter 18 says that all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So you have this crowd of people praising God and then here they see the work of God in a certain individual and it causes them to grumble. They're complaining that God would show mercy to such a wicked man. Oh, they don't mind Jesus healing blind eyes because that's amazing. That's stuff that gets them excited, thinking, man, look, God's working in our midst. He's healing blind people. But when it, they see a heartless man transformed before their eyes, they're disgusted. Verse 7 records their response. Look at it. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. They just can't believe it. They're just grumbling. In that culture, sharing a meal at a house of a sinner was a, uh, it communicated that they were like partners in crime. If you went to the house and had table fellowship with someone who, who was known for their crimes or known for their wickedness, then by you sitting there, you essentially condoned that person's wickedness. And yet Jesus was going to Zacchaeus' house, not to condone his crimes, but to save his soul. These people saw themselves worthy of the blessings of salvation, but Zacchaeus not. In other words, Jesus, we're a part of your special club. Zacchaeus is out. If Zacchaeus is in, I don't really want to be a part of this thing. They couldn't associate with Jesus or with this wretched man. And what they failed to understand, friends, is their own wretched condition. 
They saw themselves as self-righteous, as more worthy of salvation than others, rather than realizing that they were on equal footing with Zacchaeus. They were just as guilty before the bar of God's justice as this man. And it's this self-righteousness that keeps people from seeing their need for Jesus today. They take pride in their own church attendance. They take pride in their own moral behavior. They take pride in the things that they do, that they've done over their lives and thinking that makes them worthy enough. And rather than coming in desperation before Jesus, like Zacchaeus, recognizing that they owe it all to him, they believe that they deserve salvation at some level because of their moral behavior. The crowds couldn't see that they were dead in their trespasses and sins. And they were simply following their religious leadership, the scribes and the Pharisees. Because you'll recall a similar scene to this in Luke 15, 1 and 2. It says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, that's to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees, the leadership grumbled. The last time this word was used, here, Luke 15, it's used again in Luke 19. The grumbling that takes place at the open-hearted mercy of Jesus to sinners. In that scenario, Luke 15, what, did, what was Jesus' response to this? He tells three parables. One about a shepherd who searched and found a lost sheep. Another about a woman who searched and found a lost coin. And a third about a son who returned home. And all three of the parables communicated the love of God for sinners who were lost. And throughout his ministry, Jesus has tr been trying to communicate his heart for lost people and therefore reveal the heart of his Father in heaven. But this crowd has obviously learned very little from Jesus' ministry. And we need to make sure, friends, that we don't miss it ourselves, that we see the heart of Christ for sinners, for us. So the salvation that Jesus brings or gives, it brings joy on the one hand, but it can anger the self-righteous on the other. But there's, a, there's this another significant fast that we need to see in verse eight. And this is the third facet. It, it produces immediate fruit. The salvation that Jesus brings produces immediate fruit. Zacchaeus stood there before the Lord and I believe his heart was changed at this point. Jesus had called to him. His heart melted before Christ. He came down, obeyed the Lord. And there as he stood there on the Jericho street with the crowd all around, most people probably couldn't see him because of his stature, but he, Jesus was talking to him. His heart was changed. And how do we know his heart was changed? How do we know that? Well, I believe verse eight is our evidence. Verse eight, there is fruit of his repentance and faith. And it's clearly declared. Let's look at what he says, verse eight. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. First, do you notice that he calls him Lord? He calls him Lord. He recognizes who Jesus is. Behold, Lord. Listen what I've decided to do, he says. He then volunteers a course of action that's oper he's operating by new principles. And particularly, there's, there's two courses of action that he's seeking to, to operate or seeking to do. He, first of all, recognizes he's going to give half of his goods to the poor. Here he is recognizing that he has, has so much, he has abundance. And so he's able to literally cut his fortune in half and give half of it away. Just like that, boom, half gone. Now there's no place in the Old Testament law or in Jesus' teaching that commands or requires anyone to give half of their possessions away or even all of their possessions away. And I believe the Zac Zacchaeus' example here is not one that each one of us are called to follow. This is not uh, prescriptive of what all Christians are supposed to do. This is descriptive of what was going on in Zacchaeus' life. We're not called to give up everything, but riches are no longer to be our treasure. And we must be generous to those in need. And that is what Zacchaeus illustrates for us. He's, he's illustrating that riches are no longer our greatest treasure and that we are generous to those in need. This is a theme that Jesus has been teaching through the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12, 
says this, sell your possessions, Jesus is teaching here, and give to the needy, he says. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, in Zacchaeus' case, he needed to give half of his stuff away. And he made that decision personally. He, he just needed to cut it right in half. And this showed, friends, that his heart was no longer attached to his possessions, unlike the rich young ruler that still had his heart attached to all his possessions. Zacchaeus was willing to give it all away for the sake of Christ. His treasure had changed, and therefore his heart was in a different place. But this is also shown in the second action that he chooses to take. Not only is he giving away half of his stuff, but it says that if he's defrauded anyone, he will repay it fourfold. Again, there's no specific law that Zacchaeus is following here. He is modeling it somewhat like the restoring of livestock found in Exodus 22. But the point is that Zacchaeus wants to show in no uncertain terms that he is making a change of life. He is not living the old way. The old Zacchaeus is dead. He's now a new man living by new principles in a new way, a new way of life. He's following Jesus and he is no longer ruled or dominated by riches. And he's making it loud and clear in the fruit of his life. And friends, here in the example of Zacchaeus, it illustrates an important biblical truth that we cannot miss. And it's this, that repentance and faith always produce a changed life. Repentance and faith always produce a changed life. It's common for people, particularly in our country, in which the gospel has been around for many uh, generations and, and decades, that people become a Christian. They say the prayer. They walk the aisle. They make some decision at some point in their life, or maybe they've grown up in a Christian home. They've always gone to church. However, they receive that designation. And yet there's no observable fruit in their life. They continue on in the same way, even though they claim to be a Christian. There hasn't been any actions that show that Jesus is now the treasure of their life. There's been nothing that shows that they're operating under a new principle, that there's a new way of life. The Bible calls those actions that follow repentance and faith, calls them fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, there's a repentance that we've done. Repentance is making a 180 where we were going one way hard after sin and we make a 180 and we turn, go hard after Christ. We leave sin behind in the rearview mirror. That is repentance. But if we've made that decision once, we need to continue in that path and we need to continue to show fruits in keeping with that turn. Fruits in keeping with repentance. There must be continual evidence that we are continuing down that path of faith and repentance in Christ. Again, in one sense, this is only logical, right? I mean, take the example of Zacchaeus. If a thief repents, he says, I've repented, but he continues on stealing, you go, you haven't repented, I'm sorry. I need to see fruits in keeping with that turn. I need to see fruits in keeping with that claim. And so this is why, in, back in Luke 3, John the Baptist taught, he said, you must bear fruits in keeping with repentance. He was teaching this because this is the evidence of a transformed life. This shows our sincerity. It was similar in Paul's message to the Jews and the Gentiles. He said that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. And so, friends, repentance from sin and faith in Christ show itself in a changed life. The Bible's clear about that. Otherwise, if there is not a change, then there is reason to ask whether the repentance and faith has taken place at all. And so I ask you, is your life marked by a new way of life, a new principle? Are you no longer living according to your old self or are you living according to your new life in Christ? Are you more like Christ today than you were five years ago, than 10 years ago? Are you moving to, for, towards Christ over the years? It's not about perfection. It's about direction. 
It's like the schoolgirl who was saved and someone asked her, what were you before? And she said, a sinner. And they said, then, then what are you now? And she said, a sinner. And they go, well, what's the difference? She said, I was a sinner running after sin, but now I'm a sinner running away from sin. That's the difference, friends. It's about direction, not perfection. Are you headed in the right direction? Let's look finally at the last facet of the salvation Jesus gives. After Zacchaeus' declaration, uh, the, the last facet of salvation is that it is available today. It is available today. The salvation Jesus brings is available today. Zacchaeus makes this statement and Jesus then says, verse nine, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. Salvation has come. Jesus authoritatively declares that this man is saved. Who else can make such a declaration? No one. Only Jesus, the son of God, can make such a declaration. He brings salvation and therefore he knows who is saved and who is not. Zacchaeus did not earn his salvation by doing these good works. His giving away of his stuff was a fruit of his salvation that he already had. Jesus is simply acknowledging what is already clear. Zacchaeus is a changed man. He says that this is because he's a son of Abraham, a Jew. He's of the people of Israel. You see, the Jews would have thought that because Zacchaeus was such an immoral man, he was no longer able to have access to God. He was no longer able to receive the blessings that came from Abraham. But Jesus says, no, he is savable. He does have access to God. His, neither his occupation nor his sinful lifestyle has negated his access to God. He could still be counted among the redeemed of Israel. And Jesus then uses this whole example of, of Zacchaeus to illustrate for the people that day and for us today what his mission was when he came to this earth. And that is that he came to seek and to save the lost. Friends, just as salvation came to Zacchaeus 2,000 years ago, it comes to sinners today. That he is seeking and saving sinners today. Jesus is the same as he was then. He is still saving. And this is why he came. This is why he died and rose again. The reason he could save Zacchaeus on that day and the reason he can save you and I today is because he went to the cross on our behalf. He paid the penalty our sins deserved. He took the wrath that we deserved so that if we place our faith in him, we are able to be free. We are able to be forgiven. We are able to have access to God. We're able to have salvation, friends, all because of the work of Christ if we would but turn from our sin and put our faith in him. The path is the same today. So the question is, will you go to the Savior? Will you go to Jesus, who is mighty to save and yet kind in heart to receive all who would come to him? That is the question each one of us has to answer today. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this word that reminds us of the heart of Christ that Jesus does not leave sinners like us lost in our darkness. Father, you, the triune God, did not stay in heaven, but you orchestrated a plan to bring us to yourself. All of the scriptures record your plan from ages past into eternity future how you are bringing a people unto yourself and it all hinged upon the son of God taking on human flesh, living among us and then being rejected by his own, being nailed to a cross, being buried in the grave and then rising again on the third day in power and victory now ascended and sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, Jesus, we praise you this morning that you are the mighty Savior, strong enough to save and yet tender enough to come to each one of us. And I pray that for those who are here this morning, Lord, that you would be working on each one of their hearts, that they would seek to come to you, knowing that you are open-armed to all who come to you. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen.